Hello, everybody. This is a Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, we're continuing in our study of the book of John. Uh, if you have not watched the previous episodes, uh, uh, they are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Tonight, we're going to pick up where we left off in chapter 4, verse 50. Uh, but before we get started, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. It's me again. The homo. I'm glad to be here with y'all. Okay, back to you. All right, good. I, I forgot to meet myself for your talk there. I'm going to have to stay on the ball here. Um, all right. We will look at it first in the KJV because I'm a KJV firstist. And then I'll look at it in the Amplified. Uh, verse 50 says, Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Uh, I think we need to actually go back to get context here uh, so people know who Jesus is referring to. Let me read it real quickly. Uh, uh, in verse 46, it says, So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then, Jesus, uh, then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Verse 50, where we're picking up tonight. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. All right, brother. What do you say about that? Uh, I really like how Jesus... Uh, emphasized the importance of the father's was it the father and his sick son uh what son uh emphasis in the previous verses he emphasized his faith when he said uh unless you see uh signs and wonders you won't believe uh because he wanted jesus to go down there and uh uh heal his son but now when the centurion came to Jesus, he said, oh, he wouldn't even go to Jesus. He sent a messenger and said, just say the word, Jesus. And Jesus was amazed. So Jesus insists uh, that we make it easy for him. <laughs> okay, back to you. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I thought of the same thing when I read those verses. And immediately I thought of the centurion and the difference between these two the nobleman and the centurion. And uh, Jesus said, I'm sure that'll be coming up here. I believe it's probably in the, in the Gospel of John. Uh, but the difference, of course, is that centurion, uh, Jesus said, I, he's, he has never seen such great faith in all of Israel from this that the centurion demonstrated. He believed that Jesus could heal him. He didn't even have to go there to his to a servant to heal him he he would heal him just by jim just like giving the word and and he'd be healed and jesus was uh, uh commending him to everybody how great his faith was and then this nobleman he won't he believes jesus has to go down there they both had faith but the centurion understood it even better and it uh, it wasn't necessary for jesus to go there and lay hands on them it, um, but this person also did believe after jesus said go back your son is healed and then the man did believe uh, so they both had faith in a different way but what i think is interesting here is when he says uh, unless you see signs and wonders you, you won't believe uh, not talking to this man but but to, to, to israel as a whole 
They were constantly demanding signs and wonders. Uh, and I know that, uh, you know, there's a record of many miracles that Jesus performed. Uh, uh, he healed the sick, the lepers, the lame, the blind, the deaf. He even raised uh, Lazarus from the dead. He did all these miraculous signs and wonders. And, and even after that, you recall the beginning of the book of John, uh, they demanded a sign from him and, and Jesus said, uh, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. So right off in the beginning of his ministry, they're demanding a sign. And he, he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And they said, well, it took our uh, 40 years to build this temple uh, and you're going to raise it in three days. But of course, the scripture says Jesus is referring to his, his body that killed me and I'll raise myself back to life. That's the first time he's promising this bodily resurrection. And then at, later on, near the end of his three and a half year ministry, they're still demanding signs even after all the things he did. And he said the same thing in a different way. He said uh, they demanded a sign because he had claimed that he's God and Savior. And they, they're saying, if you if you are who you say you are, then prove it. Give us a sign. <laughs> Even after all the signs he's already given them, they demand another sign. And he said, the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And the scripture says that, again, this was a reference to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So twice there we have a record of him uh, promising this uh, death, burial, and resurrection as a sign to prove who he is. Um, now, I have a, couple, a question for you since while we're on this subject here. Do you believe, have you ever given any thought to this? Do you think that Jonah uh, was alive in the whale or was he dead in the whale? Uh, I remember what you believe. I believe that you believe that Jonah actually died and God resurrected him. Uh, is that not correct? Okay, now I've never comp contemplated that, and uh, I may have, but I just don't recall it at this time. Uh, if I do recall uh, my doctrine on that, I will uh, promptly interrupt you uh, at that point. Okay, back to you. <laughs> well, the reason I'm asking is uh, uh, for a long time, I believed the way that Pretty much everybody believes. I, I've never heard anybody else say this, so I'm assuming that everybody believes that Jonah was alive in the whale. In fact, that's one of the arguments you get from skeptics saying, oh, you believe Jonah was alive in the whale's body, you know, for three days. And, uh, uh, but I, I don't believe he was alive. I believe the whale, the, the whale ate him, swallowed him, and he died. Uh, otherwise, if he, if he hadn't died, then Jesus would be giving a false analogy when he, come, he said that, that his death, burial, and resurrection would be the same as Jonah's. See, he, he said that he gave Jonah as a description of what was, he was going to ha happen to him. So if Jonah was alive in the whale and Jesus said, I'm going to do that, then then we'd have to think that Jesus was really alive in the tomb instead of dead in the tomb. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that, uh, convinced of that. But before I go on, you can react to that. Then I have, I want to say something else. Um, I know that, uh, you've already voiced this, uh, opinion on Jonah. Has anybody else weighed in on it? And has any, have you got any negative feedback from it? Uh, personally, I think it's interesting and it's quite possible, but I've just never, uh, now I do remember 
uh, thinking about the Bible saying God prepared a great fish. Now, incidentally, he says the same thing about uh, Jesus in prophecy when he says, a body thou hast prepared for me. What do you think about that? I, I don't know your reference of a body he's prepared for me. I'd have to look that up and study it. Um, but regarding the question, has anybody commented on this viewpoint I just put forth? Um, I've, I've never heard anybody give me any feedback on it, whether they saying, uh, well, hey, I think you're right on that, or I think you're wrong. And nobody's ever responded. That's why I was interested in your, your opinion. Uh, but to me, it, it can't be any other way, otherwise it won't work as a, as a comparison to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to talk about is the, the idea that he's, he's saying here again, you people, let me read it exactly how he said it here. He said, uh, Verse 48, then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Um, well, we know that there was just, I can say unbelievable, because you wouldn't believe things. These are supernatural. It's not natural for a blind person from birth to, to suddenly be able to see. It's not natural. It's supernatural. And all these things that Jesus did were supernatural. So um, in that way, you can say it's unbelievable. You, you normally wouldn't believe it unless you saw it. That's what the purpose of a sign and a wonder is. You see something that's so supernatural, and it, it, uh, it opens your eyes to the truth of the supernatural world and power of God. Um, so these Jews kept on demanding these signs, and even uh, that, to me, that's, that's the reason the resurrection was so important. I mean, of course, one reason the resurrection is important is that if Jesus was dead and still, then how can he give us life if he's dead? He has to be alive to give us, keep his promise of life everlasting for us. And, uh, and Paul says that if he, he was there, what Jesus was not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. So uh, uh, the, the resurrection is important for a lot of reasons, but for the most important reason, it's the sign that he promised to put the seal on the deal and say, "Okay, you wanted a sign to you want you know I claim to be God, I claim to be Savior, I claim to be the only way to get into heaven." Okay. Here's the sign that proves it. And, and that's the, the resurrection is the, is the whole reason that the, the apostles became believers again. They lost their faith. They thought he had died. They did. They, they kind of it went in one ear out other when he was telling you about his death, burial, and resurrection. And even when he was explaining it one time, I think Peter said, no, don't say such a thing, Lord. And I think Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. At that time, uh, because it, he, he had to die to pay for our sins. But they, they rejected the whole idea, and, and uh, they thought that he would be the Messiah King. He'd defeat Rome and set up a kingdom. That's how, what they, how they imagined it was going to play out. Uh, they didn't know that he was establishing a spiritual kingdom. Uh, but that resurrection made all the difference in the world because the apostles... Once they arrested Jesus, tried him, scourged him, and killed him on the cross, all those apostles, except for one, John, all of them were hiding out for their lives because they thought that the Romans and the Pharisees, they'd be coming for them next. And they were, they were afraid, and they thought it was over. And... Uh, so when Jesus was raised from the dead and appeared to these apostles, and he really appeared to uh, 500 people in person for over a 40-day period, 
and they saw him, they talked with him, they touched him, they ate with him. And that, that resurrection and that 40 days of interacting with the people bodily was is what gave them the, the, the boldness and confidence to say, uh, well, we don't, I'm, we're not going to hide out. This is, you know, he, he's proven to us. He is God. And uh, no matter what, we can't keep our mouth shut now. We can't go in and we can't stay into hiding. That's what gave them the boldness to go out and preach in the streets of Jerusalem after the after Pentecost. So these signs and wonders are so important for that reason. And I, I've had signs and wonders in my life. But let me ask you just to respond to what I said up to that point. That's great, Brother Luke. And interestingly enough, the true believers were the ones that got the signs and wonders showed to them uh, rather than the ones that rejected the Christ. Okay. And the Jesus' bodily resurrection um, transformed these apostles from cowards into bold saints who would go out and preach for the rest of their lives the good news about Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, knowing that their lives were in peril and that they would likely be killed, but they couldn't keep their mouth shut. So the, the argument, it goes, if, if the resurrection was not true, why would these people be willing to suffer and die martyrs' deaths for something they knew was just a lie? No, uh, they wouldn't do that. That's why we know that the resurrection is a fact because no one's going to go out there and die for something they, they know is not true. Uh, now, uh, uh, Thomas, you know, uh, it, it took the resurrection for him uh, to, to have faith, to not to have faith, but to believe. Uh, but um, for me and for you, I've never seen Jesus and touched him. I've spoken to him, but he's never spoken back to me and verbally. I mean, I, I, I feel that I'm getting instructed by the Holy Spirit and, and in some ways, but it's not audible. I don't have any natural proofs in my life that I can say, yeah, Jesus appeared to me. I know, I know, it's, I know it's true. Uh, so I believe in Jesus because of my faith not because of my proof. Uh, when I first started reading the Bible and I believed, uh, I, I, I realized, it didn't take me long to realize that uh, Jesus puts a great value on believing even though we have not seen. That's the point he was making to Thomas. Uh, Jesus said, Thomas, now that you've seen me, yeah, you believe. But blessed are those who have never seen me, and yet they believe. So for some reason, Jesus really values this pure faith. Faith, the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, if Jesus had appeared to you physically, you know what? You wouldn't have faith because faith is not seeing and believing. Once you see him, it's no longer faith, it's knowledge and experience. You've, you've seen him, you've, so it's, just, it's no longer faith. Uh, but in my case, I believed without any evidence. And then over the years, I studied and I learned about the Bible prophecies. I learned about the, the, the point I made about the resurrection earlier. I learned about all kinds of things that, that convinced me the Bible's true and my my faith is not based on just blind trust. It's based on strong evidence. And all that, that kind of information, if you, if you look at my playlist, Science, God, and the Bible, or another one is called uh, Prophecies in the Bible, and then I have uh, Philosophy, God, and the Bible. Those playlists are, are apologetics playlists to prove to someone, hey, there's evidence supporting our faith. Uh, but I've personally experienced signs and wonders. I'll tell, I, I, I have a video titled Signs and Wonders, and I, I give an account of 
several times I've had miraculous signs since since I've been saved that I have no doubt at all that that uh, this is supernatural. And uh, so watch that video, uh, Signs and Wonders, uh, and you'll see for a full story on that. Okay, brother. That's a great testimony, Brother Luke. And uh, I'm in 100% agreement with you on everything you said. Sometimes we just don't feel like God is there. But you know what? Our feelings are a lie. We believe in God's word. God's word right here. That word. Uh huh. In there is his promises. And we believe those promises. The ones like, uh, he will never leave you or forsake you. And there's many, many, many more that we hold to no matter how we feel. Okay, back to you. Amen. Okay, let me, I'm going to read that portion in the Amplified and see if it there's anything to be gained from that. Uh, it says, uh, I'm going to start with... Uh, 46 again so jesus came again to cana of galilee where he had turned the water into wine and there was a certain royal official whose name whose son was sick in capernaum having heard that jesus had come back from judea to galilee he went to meet him and began asking him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death then jesus said to him Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official pleaded with him, Sir, do come down at once before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. The man believed that what Jesus said to him and started home. Okay, I'll read verse 51, you know, in the KJV. I'll read the balance of this chapter, 51 through 54. It says, And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth and himself believed in his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. I like how that he was able to confirm uh, through separate sources uh, that uh, his son was healed at the same time that Jesus told him he was healed. A lot of times uh, that's happened to me. Uh, when I recall the specific instance, I'll uh, uh, mention it, but I can't think of any right offhand. But I know it's happened to me before. How about you? Has it happened to you before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, th th that's the, the point of that, that part of the story is to confirm that the son's healing corresponded to the time when Jesus said, your son is healed. Um, it's connecting the dots so you know that the son was healed as a result of Jesus, not just some coincidence or anything else, but at the same moment in time, that's when he was healed. And uh, as I said, I, I've had... Uh, numerous things happen in my life. Uh, I've been saved now for 29 years. And since I got saved, there are numerous times where uh, there, there is no way around it. It's uh, God intervened and did a miraculous sign. I answered a prayer that was, um, it's like this example here, where it's confirmed to be God, that it could, there's no other possible explanation so watch my video signs and wonders for the details okay i'll go on to the uh next chapter now okay 
Okay, chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Well, before I go on, uh, let me ask you to respond to verses one through four. Well, I've always loved this story uh, because uh, it doesn't put God in a box and it's... Uh, It's nice to know that uh, God can do things uh, in different ways than uh, just uh, doing the same thing over and over again the same way. Uh, okay, back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there were times when I read this portion of Scripture that... Uh, um, I wondered why, you know, why God and the angels and everything was, was, uh, it, it seemed, I don't want to say ridiculous, but it, it seemed bizarre, very odd that that's the way God would work some miracles. But we know that, uh, the fact that these Jewish people are always demanding signs and wonders I mean, why would anybody demand a sign and wonder if, if signs and wonders had never happened before? <laughs> you know, I mean, you think, well, why even think of such a thing? That's never happened. No, they demand signs and wonders because they're accustomed to signs and wonders because the, God is working through these people, the, the Israel, through the prophets and the uh, Judaism. God is using them to demonstrate his himself and his power so uh the idea of being healed in this in this pool and the way it's the story is told there uh, it's just another example of of, of many times where, where god is is healing people or doing something miraculous to one to to help someone and two also as a sign uh, all through the whole book of the all the books of the Bible, we see these kinds of things going on. So people are, they're accustomed to uh, God showing himself through these signs and these miracles. Um, but the, in this case, uh, the angel would stir the water and then the first person to get in the water, they would be healed. And unfortunately, this man was never able to get in the water first. He was so lame, he could not, uh, move quickly enough to get in and so he's very frustrated and uh, uh, I'll go on but anything else you want to add to that well I feel like I had a healing in the bathtub one time and I sort of related it to that story all the time okay back to you did the water get stirred first or what? Well, we won't go into it, but. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it is kind of private and personal time in the bathtub. So. All right. Let me go on. Verse five. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that. He had been now a long time in that case. He said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man said, answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step down before me. So this crippled man is explaining the, 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 the dilemma to Jesus. 
And Jesus answers, Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, brother. Yeah, let's cue the dramatic, the dramatic music, right? Because uh, here come the lawyers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, here, the man didn't even have to um, ask Jesus to heal him. All he did was explain his dilemma. Uh, and, and and he didn't even demonstrate any faith in Jesus, but Jesus chose to help the man, even though he wasn't asked. He healed him, and he said, "Stand up and walk. You're healed." <laughs> so uh, uh, it just shows you that uh, you know we we can ask Jesus for healing. We can we can pray for for things, and but but sometimes he knows what we need, and. Uh, uh, sometimes he's going to act even before we have a chance to act, ask. Um, let me, re but uh, the problem is this is happening on the Sabbath. So let's see how that plays out. Verse 10, the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? Um, all right, let's see your response to that. Uh it appears that Jesus broke the Sabbath. Uh, would you like to defend his actions? Yeah, well, um, what the, what the um, Pharisees particularly did, and that the rabbis, ever, ever since Mosaic Law was laid down, I mean, there's 613 laws, but... Uh, <laughs> You think 613 laws are a lot? It's nothing compared to what the, the, the rabbis and the Pharisees added to it. Because they said, it said, don't do any work on the Sabbath. And that, that they said, you could only pick up something that was a certain size and you could only t take so many steps. They really, they, they tried to refine the law even more and make it even more strict uh, so, so that they could basically, uh, everybody be guilty. You couldn't possibly follow the law. First of all, you couldn't follow the law the way it was written because uh, it's too, too strict to be followed perfectly unless you're Jesus. And you certainly couldn't follow it the way the Pharisees, uh, ratcheted it, tightened it down, you know? And, uh, so he was not supposed to even pick up something beyond a certain size and take any more than a certain number of steps or he's violating the Sabbath by working instead of resting on the Sabbath. So they're, uh, they're upset at the, the, the crippled man who was healed because of he's working on the Sabbath. And now they find that Jesus is the one or somebody told him, some whoever healed him told him to pick up and carry his things and 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 so they know that somebody told the man to violate this law and on top of that they're probably thinking well not only did he tell this crippled man to carry his thing and violate the sabbath but if he healed him on the sabbath then he broke the habit the sabbath because he's working on the habit doing healing they're uh, really uh straining gnats and swallowing camels okay it goes on um, verse 13 
And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. Uh, I want to read that in the Amplified, but first I'll give you a chance to respond to it. Oh, wow. These are interesting verses here. What struck me was in verse 13 where Jesus conveyed himself away. Whenever I hear him doing that, I imagine him supernaturally uh, beaming himself to another location, which he could do. I believe he did it several times uh do you think he may have had that capability and had in, actually employed it uh before he died on the cross yeah yeah I, we we may be coming to this uh in john you know that uh between matthew mark luke and john uh these accounts these gospel accounts are written by Matthew, who was an apostle, Mark, who was the the, the protege of of Peter, uh, so he Mark was really written like as though it's Peter's gospel. Uh, Luke, he wrote it. He was a historian. He interviewed everybody, studied it, and wrote wrote a historical account uh, of it. And then John, of course, is the faithful apostle that never left Jesus even when he was crucified, and so he wrote down. These, this gospel account. In the four gospel accounts, not every story is in each one of them. Like this, this story here um, that we're just reading about the man being healed at the Bethesda, it might be in one of the gospel accounts, it might be in two or three or all four of them. It varies because it's, each account is given by a different person. If you and I spent three and a half years with Jesus, and then we wrote an account of what uh, what we recalled and what the Holy Spirit inspired us to write. And, and uh, you know, I, I might mention things that you didn't mention, uh, but it doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that I, I chose to mention that, mention that, or the Spirit led me to mention that, and, and you were led to emphasize something else. Um, but this this particular story here, I don't know if it, it's going to uh, be in the other gospel the gospel accounts or not. But your your question was about the um, the disappearing of Jesus, and I know there's a, a, an example of him being in a, a surrounded by people, and they wanted to stone him and kill him, and he he just disappeared and he was somewhere else. And is that how did he how did he escape when he's completely surrounded by a mob that wants to stone him for blasphemy because he claimed to be God? Um, he said, "Why do you want to stone me?" And he says, "For what have I? What evil have I done, or something to that you want to stone me?" It's not. And they say it's not because of that. It's because of blasphemy. Because you. Uh, being a man, make yourself to be equal with God. That's why we're going to stone you, you know. <laughs> but he's gone. Now, how did he do it? Well, you know, uh, I do believe that uh, even before his uh, resurrected body, that uh, these are accounts of him of being just materialized in a different place. Uh, there's no, there's no um, explanation. But that's just something that it seems like a, a logical assumption on my part. What do you think? I think you're right, Brother Luke, and I believe there's three of them. One was John the Baptist after he was baptized, this particular one, and then the one that you referred to. Uh, those are the only three that I'm aware of. Okay, now on the 14, uh, that's another interesting verse. Because now Jesus it appears to have sought this guy out. That he healed and he had something more to impart to him and he says behold thou art made whole sin no more lest the worst thing come to thee 
So uh, Jesus wasn't finished with him. What do you think about that? Yeah. Um, well, I, I want to read it in the Amplified, and then I'll answer you. But uh, let me see verses. Uh, verse 13, now the man who had been healed did not know who it was for Jesus had slipped away unnoticed since there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Stop sinning and some, or something else, something worse may happen to you. Uh, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Um, well, the interesting thing about that is that um, this verse, um, to me, it, it's an easy explanation that, that it doesn't violate uh, uh, the, the doctrine of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. And yet uh, the, the heretics who, uh, the, the, it's it, the damnable heretics. When I say there's a difference between holding a, a, a false belief and, and holding a false belief that will send you to hell. And that's a damnable heresy. And that's if you are wrong on gospel and salvation and, and, and uh, who Jesus is and why you need him. If you're wrong on that, that's a damnable heresy. Uh, but there are people who are, uh, you know, wrong on some other things and okay, they, that the, the result is not hell, but uh, in this case, it's very serious because there's a group of people who believe that faith alone in Christ alone is insufficient. They, they, they believe that you can believe in Jesus and trusting him for your salvation, believing he died for your sins, he was buried and he raised from the dead. He has power to give you life everlasting if you'll trust him completely. They say, oh, that's, that's insufficient. More is required of you. You've got to do religious works too. You've got to stop sinning. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to change your life. You've got to get water baptized. You've got to do all kinds of good works. You've got to follow all kinds of religious rules. See, these people uh, are changing the gospel uh, to a, a gospel that's not the true gospel, that's a damnable heresy. Paul says that if you, if you preach any other gospel rather than the true gospel of faith alone and Christ alone, you're accursed. And many people will take a verse like this and build on it this, this false damnable heresy. Because they'll say, Jesus says to him, uh, where did he, oh yeah, verse 14. Thou art, behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So anytime Jesus says to someone, sin no more. He said, he said to the prostitute that he saved from being stoning. Who condemns you? No, no one condemns you. Well, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Uh, just because Jesus is saying, stop your sinning, we, we should not be connecting that to salvation. Uh, the, the way you should understand this verse and the command of not sinning anymore is connected to more problems coming because of a result of sin. Just as he says in this verse, unless something worse could happen to you if you sin. Like, what, hap what happens if the man decides, oh, he's going to go celebrate and start drinking too much and 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 uh, become a drunkard and he's so happy he's healed and, and uh, he gets drunk and walks over the end of a cliff, <laughs> falls down to his death, you know? When you sin, the consequences result from these Bad conduct, bad decisions, bad behavior, bad consequences come from it. So that Jesus was telling the man, just as he told the prophet, come on, stop your sinning. It's just going to get you into trouble. But the Lordship salvation is those heretics. They want to take a verse like that and build a false doctrine that, see, you got to stop your sinning or else you go to hell. 
Hey, brother, what's your reaction? Now, at what point did this guy get saved? Uh, when Jesus healed him? Is that when he got saved? And was Jesus saving people on credit before the cross? Well, in this case, I'm not even putting forth the idea that the, the man got saved. He got healed. Did he get saved? Um, it doesn't speak about that, so I, I'm not going to speak on it. Uh, but I'm just saying that a text taken out of context is a pretext. And if we look at the context of this, this go and sin no more, then the context is is uh, not about, um, oh, if you sin, continue sinning, you're going to go to hell. No, if you continue sinning, something worse could happen, like the example I just gave, okay? So you, you can't take a text out of context and build a false doctrine, a false religion on, on those texts. Um, I'm going to read it in the Amplify. Oh, I think I already did, didn't I? Let me go on. Um, so the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day but Jesus answered them my father worketh hitherto and I work therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and sheweth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth the Honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority, execute judgment also, because he, he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John and he bear witness of the truth but I receive not testimony from man but these things i say that ye may be saved he was a burning and a shining light and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light but i have a greater witness than that of john for the works which the father hath given me to finish the same works that i do bear witness of me that the father hath sent me and the father himself which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, ye believe not. Research the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, 
that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come into my Father's name, and ye have re ye receive me not. If another shall come into his, in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe, which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Sorry, brother, I couldn't stop after a few verses. We was on a, I was on a roll there. That, 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 that whole speech was so important. Um, what we'll do is I'll just ask you to respond just the basic to it, and, and then we'll go into it in more detail next time. Uh, that's a very uh, great passage that you just read, and it's so full of excellent theological topics and such uh it would we would do well to be very familiar with this passage even so far as to memorize it i would say okay i don't think i ever memorized this chapter uh no i did not okay back to you all right, brother. Uh, there's a there's a lot in there, and it, and it was so such a powerful speech that he made, I guess, or or announcement, and that uh, you know I needed to read it in in its entirety. We'll go over next time slowly, verse by verse, and really analyze it and break it down. And I'm, I'll be very excited to do that, but. For now, we're out of time, so let me take a few minutes to tell people uh, the good news about the free gift of salvation. Uh, this is what the Bible refers to as the gospel. It's a Greek word that means good news. Now, uh, I'm going to explain this to you in my own words briefly, but uh, on all my videos, I post in the description section of the video, I post a series of verses that uh, so you can see that what I'm telling you now is not just my own philosophy or theory. Uh, what I'm telling you now is supported by the verses I'm going to post in the description box. So I hope you go read those book verses and study it carefully. But here's there, there's good news, and and that is that uh, if you want to go to heaven, uh, Jesus will give you eternal life in heaven as a free gift. He's offering it to you right now. He's offering it to everybody in the world right now. And, and it, 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 whosoever you are, any person in the world, no exceptions, you can receive the gift of eternal life from Jesus right now. And nothing would make him happier than you accepting that gift. But here's the problem. Almost all the people in the world today Almost all the people who have ever lived have believed that in order to go to heaven, that was determined by personal merit. They think that, well, when we die, we see God and he judges us. The Bible does say that we'll all be judged. And they think that the people that get to go into heaven are the good people. And the people that are not good enough, especially the really bad people, they go to hell. So they think that the destiny of heaven or hell is determined by personal merit. But I want you to know that is the lie from the devil. It's the, it's the, it's the greatest lie ever told. If, if, you know, if you want, you can try to get to heaven through your own merit, go ahead and try if you want, but I'm gonna tell you right now, that is doomed to failure because the standard that you have to meet according to the Bible is perfection. It's called the glory of God. If, if you can reach a level where you are equal to the glory of God, perfection, 
then you can get into heaven. But unfortunately, it's already too late for you because you've already sinned, and that means you're not perfect. Now, how do I know you've sinned? <laughs> I don't know you. You've never met me. How, do, how can I claim that you've sinned? Because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is the first thing you need to understand. It's already too late for you to try to be perfect. You've already failed, just like me. We've all sinned. The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So the first thing you need to understand is it's already too late for you. You've sinned. You're guilty. You can't get into heaven because of that sin. Now, you could repent of your sin and try to change your life and try to strive, but the Bible says you'll fall short of the glory. You'll never be able to attain perfection. So the first thing I want you to understand is you need to repent. And when I say repent, I'm talking about change your mind about, try, about the possibility of getting into heaven through personal merit. Reject that, I, that philosophy. That's the devil's way. The Bible says that's man's way but it's not God's way. So reject that and accept the fact that it's impossible. The, Jesus was explaining this to his apostles and he, he, they said, well, if, if that's the case, Lord, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? How is it possible for anyone to get into heaven then? And Jesus said, well, with man, it is impossible. Did you hear that? Jesus said it is impossible for you to get into heaven through your own efforts, but he says with God, all things are possible. So if you if you will trust God to get you to heaven, then you can go. But if you're trying to get there on your own, it's impossible. Now, the Bible says that there's only one Savior, and, and God is the Savior. And the Bible says Jesus is the Savior, and it says Jesus is God. So that's why I want you to understand that Jesus is our great Savior God. And, and he, he says that he doesn't desire that any of us should perish. He wants all of us to, to get into heaven. So he's offering eternal life in heaven to you as a free gift if you'll trust him instead of trying to get there on your own. Now, I want you to understand why this is possible. Okay? Uh, First of all, you, we know that Jesus is God, and he came down from heaven and became a man. It said the, he became flesh and lived among us as a man named Jesus, God and man. And Jesus said the reason that he became a man was simply so he could give his life as a ransom. A ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. So Jesus gave his life as a payment to set us free from judgment and condemnation and hell. So he died so that you don't have to go to hell, so that you can go to heaven. He paid for all of our sins. Now, if he, would, if he's, if he just died and stayed dead, he couldn't save us. He'd be dead. <laughs> so the good news is he was buried, and after three days, he raised himself back to life bodily. We talked about this throughout the study tonight about the bodily resurrection. And that resurrection is what proves that he is God and he does have power over life and death. So the resurrection is what gives us all confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified, that he is who he claimed to be that he does have the power to give us life everlasting and that he is faithful to keep the promise. So because I put my faith in Jesus, I'm guaranteed to go to heaven. I'm, it's called the blessed assurance. I'm assured I'm going to go to heaven. No matter what I do the rest of my life, I don't ever have to worry because the Bible says he will never leave me or forsake me. I'm guaranteed heaven. And I want you to have the same assurance, the same joy, the blessed assurance of the promise of eternal life in heaven. And all we're asking you to do, all Jesus asks you to do, the only thing required of you is to trust him for your salvation instead of trying to get there some other way. Depend on Jesus completely. Rely completely on Jesus.
and he will take you to heaven. You see my icon right here? That's the picture of Jesus wanting to take you up to heaven. Just reach out to Jesus, embrace him, and rely on him completely, and he will take you to heaven. It's a promise from God, so you can believe it. Uh, so I hope you will put your faith in Jesus now. And if you do, please make a comment on this video. And uh, Brother brother Eric, uh, I'll give you the last word on this. I am so thankful for God's salvation, which is so great and so rich and full and free that I would like to uh, offer those who have received it recently to just thank God for it uh, in a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and rising again the third day so we can spend eternity with you in paradise, one with you, our God, our Father, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. We received that free gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now go and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, back to you. Okay, uh, Brother Eric, thank you for participating tonight. And uh, viewers, uh, join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. And we'll, we'll continue the study of John where we left off last time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.